What is up you guys, my name is Austin Marks and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So I am currently a respiratory therapist who is pursuing the physician assistant career path. On my channel I make videos talking about respiratory therapy as well as I'm documenting my journey to becoming a PA. So if you want to see all that, make sure you like and subscribe. So in today's video I'm going to be talking about traumas and what do respiratory therapists do necessarily in a trauma? What is a trauma? Um, do we just respond to the trauma? Do we treat the patient after the trauma has occurred once they've come in and been admitted to the hospital? What the heck happens during a trauma and what do we do about it? So what exactly is considered a trauma? So for a trauma basis there are a couple levels. There is a level 2 trauma as well as a level 1 trauma. Um, there are also going to be a level 3 trauma but you don't really see them too often within a trauma bay. Um, a level 1 trauma is definitely the worst. So what is considered a level 1 trauma versus level 2? So level 2 maybe somebody fell, there could be been a vehicle accident, but the person isn't that hurt but yet they still need to come to the hospital and maybe be evaluated. A level 1 is somebody got severely injured, um, potentially intubation is needed. So I've seen a few of these that are pretty severe such as car accidents, uh, stabbings, someone shot themselves. Um, talking about stabbings, stabbings can be level 2 or level 1. Generally they're level 1 just because EMS calls in, hey we have a stab, uh, blah blah blah. But if it's a stab in the leg, that can cause some serious injury sometimes, so they will call a level 1 for that even though we get there and respiratory is not needed. So some other crazy things I've seen is I've seen people that have fallen out of tree stands while hunting. I've seen things like older people falling on their bobby pin while sewing. Um, I've seen people get stuck in elevators and the elevator crush them. I've seen gunshots. I In a trauma bay you will see it all. But what exactly does respiratory do for the trauma? So at my hospital we have pagers and whenever there's a trauma coming in um, we get paged. So it's a level 2. Respiratory does not go to that trauma because it's not always needed. But if it's a level 1, respiratory always goes to the trauma. So when we get there we gown up and everything. Um, sometimes we put face shields on depending what exactly it is, if blood may be splattered. But generally it's just a gown and gloves. So what I generally do is I go to the head of the bed, I will get the ventilator ready, I will get everything set up to intubate. So this may include like uh, putting the ventilator all together, getting the ET tab, um, making sure that we have end title. Um, so I just want to make sure that we have everything. I may get the tube out ready for anesthesia. So that's another thing at my hospital is we have anesthesia intubate. At some hospitals the trauma doctor will intubate maybe the trauma PA or NP but at my hospital we have anesthesia who comes down to the trauma bay and they are the ones who intubate. Um, everyone works well as a team when a trauma comes in. Um, we make sure we fully assess the patient, do everything we need to and we do an ultrasound. We just make sure that we get a full perspective of the patient. Sometimes this isn't always the easiest thing because when a level 1 trauma comes in from several gunshots to the chest, you don't have a whole lot of time to work and I mean you gotta go go go. So I mean you may have to listen to the breath sounds, check for bleeding, um, mark where bullet wounds are, intubate and then head off either to the OR or most times um, when a trauma comes in we will go directly to CT after getting the patient situated. We'll get an x-ray when they're in the bay on the table and then we go over to CT. Um, we do a CT to look at potentially the whole body. So we'll look at the head, we'll look at the, uh, the neck portion, we'll look at the chest, the abdomen, the pelvis maybe, and then, uh, sometimes even the lower uh, limbs. So the reason that they do a full body CT is because we don't want to miss anything because um, if the patient has a fractured cervical vertebrae, we want to make sure that we have a C collar on them and that we're extra careful because bad things can happen with a severed uh, cervical vertebrae. So we definitely want to be extra careful with that. So some other things that we'll do is um, we'll go ahead and listen to the patient. We'll ask them several questions um, if they're capable of answering, such as do you smoke, do you have diabetes? We go through an entire list of different questions just because we want to have even more of a full perspective of our patient. So once the patient comes out of CT, where do they go? So as I said, if they have gunshots everywhere or they're bleeding internally, we may go directly to the OR. So therefore, we don't even get a CT. We'll get a CT after they get out of the OR because they need surgery now. 
most level one traumas will go directly to the ICU. And once they're in the ICU, we'll get them situated. Uh, maybe we'll put in a central line, an A line, um, all that other jazz. I mean, it just depends exactly how extensive the, uh, the injuries are. Sometimes um, when a level two trauma comes in, they may get sent to um, a floor. I know this may sound crazy, but sometimes a trauma can be something as simple as um, someone falling on blood thinners, because someone falling on blood thinners can lead to a stroke, which is not a good thing at all. But if they fall on blood thinners and they come in and everything's okay, maybe they just have like a small fracture in the wrist or something, then they're obviously going to go just to a floor rather than the ICU. So with all of our trauma patients, what respiratory does is we need to do an incentive spirometer or an ISB. So if we do this with them and they cannot do it, we will go ahead and do an easy pap. So this is like them blowing against a uh, positive pressure just to help open up the lungs and, and just help prevent things such as pneumonia. So we do have a protocol at my hospital and if a patient has one fractured rib, just one, they need to do an ISB for several days just to get everything moving again. Um, now sometimes what we'll do after a few days is if they're getting 50% or more of their predicted, then we'll go ahead and DC this, but, but we'll make sure that they're actually expanding their lungs and that they're not just sitting there taking little shallow breaths. Not doing anything because that is not good for the patient. Um, they're more likely, likely to get pneumonia and take steps backwards rather than progressing forward. How long do trauma patients stay? Um, this totally depends on the extensiveness of their injuries. So if someone gets intubated and they have severe head injury, um, they may be intubated for a while. We may end up shipping them out to another hospital who has more neuro perspective, um, if we can't do everything for the patient, then this other uh, hospital may have the capabilities of going ahead and doing a full neuro evaluation. Um, my hospital doesn't do every single surgery there is um, on the planet, so sometimes we need to send patients out for that as well. But most times we'll fix the patient up, we'll get them good to go. So sometimes when traumas come in, it may be a fallen person found down. So then they come in and we have no idea what's going on. This is considered a trauma rather than just an EMS arrival at my hospital. So with this, we may bring the patient in and then they start acting up and getting all crazy and whatever. So we may have to intubate them because they won't let us evaluate them. So I had a uh, person like this not too long ago. We brought them in. They were totally unresponsive. As soon as we laid them on the trauma bay bed, they just started freaking out, trying to get up, and they were intoxicated pretty severely, so I mean, they had no idea what they were doing, and it was, it was crazy. So what we did is we went ahead and we intubated them, just to sedate them, that way we could do a full evaluation, make sure there was nothing wrong with this patient. Um, and this does happen in the hospital. If someone is not compliant and they are injured, we sometimes intubate them just to get a full perspective and make sure that everything is okay. So now, so now saying this, this patient was intoxicated, it was on Thanksgiving actually, so they probably had a big old meal and they ended up puking everywhere, which is pretty disgusting, but uh, sometimes you have to deal with that in traumas. So you think traumas are gunshots, stabs, whatever, but this person puked, so you may have to deal with poop and puke when you're dealing with the trauma as well sometimes. So with this patient, we brought them to the MRI, uh, got a full scan with that, we did CT, we did chest x-ray, we did the whole workup. They were completely okay. They were just intoxicated and found down. So therefore, what we did was we ended up extubating them that night. So with some traumas, it's this easy. They come in, we intubate them. Um, not always because they're acting crazy, but just just because we intubate them because uh, maybe they were assaulted or something and uh, they had a concussion, got knocked out, whatever. Um, and they weren't protecting their airway. That was definitely something to be worried about, so that's why we intubated them. Sometimes we will extubate them the same night. Just because there's no reason for them to be intubated. So if you guys have any questions about traumas whatsoever, you want to hear some more stories that I have, um, just leave in the comments and I'll go ahead and answer any of those questions. If you like this video, make sure you like and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions, leave a comment about that as well. I'll see you in the next one.